approximation resistance, which we call strong approximation resistance. And I'll define uh, the terms as we go along. Okay. So first, well, the basic things, we're talking about KCSPs. Uh, you have n Boolean variables, uh, m constraints, and they look like this. Right. So you can have uh, sat constraints or cut constraints on a graph where you're just saying that the vertices you know, do not get the same label if they uh, share an edge between them, and so on and so forth. And this is one of the most fundamental classes of problems, yada, 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 and so on. <laughs> so, I mean, that sort of things, I guess, has been said quite a few times by now. Uh, so let me just set up some notation and let me define um, uh, 3xor uh, in, uh, in plus minus one variable. So you have, three, you have variables which are supposed to be plus or minus one and you have some constraints on their products uh, uh, of some three tuples. Okay. And you can write it in a way that uh, the right hand side is, uh, is the same for all of them and some variables uh, have been multiplied by a negative sign. Okay. And in general, if you are given some predicate uh, which takes uh, k plus or minus one variables, output zero or one, you can think of each constraint as a uh, as this predicate f applied to uh, a k-tuple of variables, some of them possibly negated. Right? So we just let's denote whether the variable is negated or not by a sign b uh, sub 1i for the ith constraint and the first variable in the ith constraint and so on. Okay. This is the notation, okay? Just, uh, I guess it's fairly standard. So, so again, we'll be studying the question of uh, finding the maximum fraction of satisfiable constraints and uh, the notion of approximating them, so you approximate within a factor gamma if you want, if you can decide uh, whether the fraction of satisfiable constraints uh, by an assignment is uh, more than gamma times theta or less than theta. If you can solve this problem for all theta, then you have a gamma approximation algorithm. And if there's some theta for which you cannot solve it, then that's a gamma in approximability result. Okay. Uh, and approximation resistance kind of comes uh, from the maximum possible uh, gap you can have between the red and the green regions here. So let's define rho of f, which is a parameter, which measures uh, if, you, if you plug in a random assignment, what's the probability that a constraint will be satisfied, constraint according to f. Uh, uh, right, so for 3 sat, it's 7 eighths, for xor, it's half, and so on. And we call a uh, function f approximation resistant if we have uh, this kind of an inapproximability result, which is... Uh, it's hard to distinguish between when you can satisfy almost all constraints or no more than rho of f. And again, the way rho of f is defined, uh, it's trivial to satisfy rho of f fraction of constraints just by using a random assignment. And to be more correct, uh, f is approximation resistant if for every epsilon greater than zero, we have an inapproximability result of this form. Okay. And you know, as I said, it captures the notion of when it's hard to do better than a random assignment. Okay. All right. So. I mean, we'll be talking of characterizations, but before that, let me just sort of say some of the sufficient conditions or some of that have been known to imply approximation resistance. And this is the first classic result, which is, I guess, from 97 in the general version from 2001, all when I was in high school, uh, is that uh, sat and XOR are approximation resistant uh, on any k variables for k greater than or equal to 3. Okay. And uh, Haast took it uh, quite a bit further on uh, studying predicates on four variables, and out of 400... Uh, of non-trivial, non-isomorphic predicates which are not isomorphic to each other. He classified 79 of them to be approximation resistant, 275 to be not so, and the remaining 46 are open as far as I know. Okay. So, I mean, so it was quite an extensive uh, bit of work. Okay. And some classes of predicates which have been shown to be approximation resistant. Uh, so I'll use a star for uh, results which are about unique games hardness or which assume unique games conjecture. So the result of Samblinsky and Trevisan from 2006, which was converted into NP hardness by Chan, uh, which I guess you heard to talk about in the morning, is that certain classes of predicates, instead of XOR, if you think of an AND of XOR, which can be thought of as a subspace of F2 to the K, and if these uh, subspaces have some nice properties, then uh, F, or F is approximation resistant. And the nice property is that, well, given that it is a subspace, when I look at the uniform distribution of f inverse 1 or on the satisfying assignment, that's a pairwise independent distribution, and it's balanced. So every bit is 1 or minus 1 with equal probability, and every pair has uh, all four configurations with probability 1 fourth. Okay. If you want only unique games hardness, there's a beautiful generalization of this result, which is uh, you don't need this subspace property, but as long as there exists any balanced and pairwise independent distribution which is supported on the satisfying assignments, 
the, the predicate is approximation resistance. And this is the uh, result of Austin and Mosell from 2009. Okay. So these are all sufficient conditions which show a fairly large class of predicates to be approximation resistant. And I must say, if you look at random predicates, almost all predicates have these kind of properties. So it's, it's a fairly large class. The characterization, so the previous to this work, was by Austin and Court, which is in some special cases where f is even, which means if you flip all the variables, the value of the predicate does not change. And the instance is required to be k partite. So that's sort of a restriction not just on the predicate, but on what kind of problem instance you are given. So each constraint, uh, so you can think of your variables being arranged as in, in k layers, and each constraint picks its first variable from the first layer, second from the second layer, and so on and so forth. Okay. And you talk of uh, sort of, uh, so it, it is conceivable that if you have this arrangement, the problem will become easier or some instance will become easier to solve uh, without, uh, than without this, uh, uh, without this condition on the instance. And so this characterization is not necessarily the same uh, as a characterization of uh, general instances, and we believe it's somewhat restrictive. Okay, okay so let me change the question a little bit. And uh, instead of approximation resistant, if, uh, resistance, if you look at uh, what we call uh, strong approximation resistance, the problem becomes uh, somewhat easier to understand and the, the sort of nice characterizations that follow. So let me at least define what that notion is before we uh, talk about it. Okay. So just to recall, F is approximation resistant if it's, uh, well, we have some kind of hardness, NP hardness or unique games hardness, uh, about uh, distinguishing these two cases. In, in strong approximation resistance, the two cases are either more, most of the constraints are satisfiable or the uh, fraction of constraints satisfiable by any assignment is essentially around what a random assignment would do. Okay? You cannot even satisfy much less than a random assignment. Okay? Or it's hard to distinguish between those two cases. So it's sort of a promise problem, but with a stronger promise. So in, in one case, you have this. In the other case, you have a promise of this kind, and you still want to distinguish between them. Okay. In terms of an algorithm, you want to think of an algorithm uh, given an instance which is 1 minus epsilon satisfiable, the algorithm wants to do anything different from a random assignment. Either it wants to satisfy more than rho of f plus epsilon or less than rho of f minus epsilon, but it not within this interval and find something different. Okay. So, as I said, so this categorize uh, when is it uh, possible or not possible to do anything at all which is different from a random assignment. Okay. And, I mean, Depending on how you believe, this could also be a fairly natural notion to study, at least as far as we are con comparing ourselves with random assignment or trivial algorithms. Okay. Is, is the notion of strong approximation resistance? Okay. Okay. And sort of a simple observation that for odd predicates, where if you flip the sign of all the variables, the value of the predicate changes, this is equivalent to approximation resistance. Because if you have an assignment which does rho of f plus epsilon, if you flip every bit, it'll have rho of f, it'll satisfy rho of f minus epsilon fraction of constraints. Okay, so just if you if you can do rho of f plus epsilon, you can do rho of f minus epsilon, and vice versa, actually, which is an important part. And also, I should say that previously, all known results in the PCP literature, except for one that I know by heart, uh, actually prove strong approximation resistant, because the way you prove such a result is by applying some kind of invariance principle, which uh, bounds the absolute value of the term you get when you analyze the PCP, which is absolute value of everything other than rho of f. Right? And once you get a bound on the absolute value, you are actually proving strong approximation resistance. So almost any result which uses uh, invariance principle ends up proving strong approximation resistance. So it's, it's not a completely bizarre notion. It's been studied, uh, at least implicitly, in all, all the hardness results now. Okay. All right. So. Before I go to a characterization that we will give, I mean, there's also already sort of a characterization which follows from the works of Raghavendra and Steyer. Okay. So it's a characterization in the following sense. So Prasad's result, uh, it's a very beautiful result from 2008, which uh, shows that uh, if you have an integrality gap for some kind of natural SDP relaxation, which is some kind of a hard instance, then you have a, a, a hardness of approximation result, again, assuming you against conjecture and hence the star. Okay. Uh, an integrality gap is just sort of a concrete instance where some basic SDP relaxation uh, has, uh, which is an op sort of uh, some kind of optimization program, has value which is supposed to be the fraction of constraints satisfiable and the value of the SDP is close to one. Whereas actually on that instance, you cannot satisfy more than rho of f plus epsilon fraction of constraints. And if such an instance exists, uh, then the uh, f is approximation resistant and vice versa because the Prasad showed the equivalence between these two nations. Uh, and what the work of uh, uh, 
Prasad Raghavendra and David Stoyer from 2009 shows is that if you're looking for such an instance, you don't have to go too far. Uh, such an instance will only always, you can always find such an instance with size at most doubly exponential in epsilon. Okay. So this is uh, sort of a recursively enumerable characterization, right? I mean, you want to check if for every epsilon, uh, there exists an integrality gap instance, which is 1 minus epsilon versus rho of f plus epsilon. So just do a brute force search in all instances of this size and keep going for smaller and smaller epsilon. And uh, I mean, if for some epsilon you cannot find such an instance, then you can say that uh, this is not approximation resistant. And otherwise, you just keep going. Okay. So that's, in that sense, it's a recursively, it's a characterization. But I call it a partial characterization because it sort of doesn't explain what properties of f actually give us uh, these, yeah, sorry. Oh, is it? Uh, perhaps I was mistaken. Because Prasad can tell us if the size is singly or doubly exponential. But uh, so there was some sort of log in the correction procedure. Uh, and so if, uh, well, at most doubly exponential. At most doubly exponential is definitely correct. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's true. Okay. Still a true statement, fortunately. Um, oh, hopefully. So in terms of characterization, I'm looking for what properties of f give rise to such hard instances. I mean, so far what we have said is uh, f is hard if there exists a hard instance witnessing it, but that doesn't feel sort of a proper characterization. In particular, I'm looking for something on the lines of Austin and Mosell's result, which says, well, if such a nice pairwise independent distribution exists, then uh, uh, f is approximation resistant, or something on those lines. Okay. And also the second question I can ask, which um, uh, is that whether it's just the property of f that um, makes the instance hard, or um, or is it something about how you choose the different constraints which fit together in an integrality gap instance? And the integrality gap has an, and sort of uh, whether the first variable should be shared between the first constraint and the tenth constraint, and so on and so forth. So, is it the topology of the instance that is important, or is it just properties of f? Okay. And well, you can kind of get a hint from what we're talking about. Okay, so. So this is the kind of characterization I'm looking for, and I'll, let me, I'll give you one for a strong, uh, strong approximation resistance in this talk. Okay. So before we go there, let me set up some notation. And, uh, and okay, just to mention, I said this argument about 1 minus epsilon versus rho of f plus epsilon, but the whole thing also works for strong approximation resistance. So it gives a characterization in this form of strong approximation resistance also, the results of Prasad and David. Okay. So let me state the Austin Mosel condition in different language and sort of also help set up some notation. So let's consider any distribution on uh, plus minus 1 to the k. And let's consider the single and so the first and second moments of that distribution. Okay, so you sample in x from that distribution, look at the ith bit of x, and look at its bias, or the correlation between the ith and jf bit. Or so the pair. Okay. And just look at this collection, uh, this vector of all the moments, which has k plus k choose two coordinates. And let's just call it zeta of mu. And let's define this polytope, which is a convex polytope, where you collect all such moment vectors for any distribution which is supported on uh, satisfying assignments. Okay. Um, and our characterization will be in terms of this polytope. But before that, the austin mosel condition is saying that zero is in this polytope. Right? You have a vector which is ba so it's balanced, implies zeta i's are zero, and pairwise independence means zeta i, zeta j is zero for I, every i and j. i not equal to. Okay. So, this is a sufficient condition of Austin and Mosel. And our condition will be in some kind of, will be in terms of, so this condition is in, in terms of existence of a certain point inside this polytope. And if you look at some other results by uh, uh, so Austin and Hastad, they're also about existence of certain other points in this polytope, with, uh, where you don't have all coordinates to be zero, but sort of some of them can be negative or positive in some especially chosen way. Okay. Uh, our condition will be in terms of existence of some measure on this polytope. And if a measure satisfying certain kind of symmetry properties exists, then f is approximation resistant. And more importantly, if it does not exist, then the f is not approximation resistant. So it's a necessary and like sufficient and necessary condition. Okay. Any questions at this point or about this notation? Yes, exactly. So a point in this polytope is of the form zeta mu. Right, so zero is in this polytope means uh, there exists a mu, or there exists a point in this polytope which is of this form, which is equal to zero. So zeta of mu is equal to zero for some mu. Right? And, uh, a point in this polytope exactly corresponds to zeta of mu for some mu. Right? 
I mean, a convex combinations of distributions also a distribution. So any point in this polytope is. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's convex. Yeah, yeah, it's convex. Yeah, yeah, I'm not taking a convex cell. Okay. Right. So, so before I go to those symmetry conditions, let me tell you some ways of transforming a measure uh, lambda on this. Basically, I'll tell you some way of transforming every point in this uh, polytope. And a transformation of a, of a measure will be defined with respect to some natural transformations on the points. And then the symmetry conditions I can state more conveniently in terms of those. So let me, so these are some natural operations that come up. Uh, you sort of see I mean, sort of why they come up is sort of in the proof, but it's easy to see the conditions as such. Okay. So suppose we have uh, uh, zeta, which is, I should remind you, is a, is a vector of first and second moments. Okay. And of some k, some distribution corresponding to plus, on on plus minus one to the k. Okay. So maybe I can permute the underlying k variables and that will sort of permute the coordinates of zeta in some natural way. Right. The ith coordinate will go to the pi ith coordinate and the ijth coordinate will go to pi i pi j for the second correlation. Right. So this is a fairly natural transformation of a point. I can multiply a variable by a sign and the ith variable by a sign bi. So the moment corresponding to i will be multiplied by bi and the moment corresponding to ij will be multiplied by bi times bj. Right. This is again a fairly natural transformation of a point or uh, which corresponds to like uh, well, every point in the support of some distribution, I just multiply by the, like the ith coordinate by bi. Okay. And maybe I can choose to sort of restrict myself to some subset of uh, variables, some subset s of the k variables instead of all of them. So if the subset has says uh, t, then I will get uh, a vector of size t plus t choose 2 instead of k plus k choose 2. Okay. So this will be some kind of projection of uh, a point zeta. And then if I apply all three of them to each point in the support of some measure, I get some sort of natural uh, transformation of that measure. Okay. So this is, so when I say lambda s pi b, this is what I will mean. I have some set s, which is a subset of the k variables, uh, some permutation on the set and some sort of signing of the set. And I apply the transformation, uh, so this transformation to every point in the support of uh, lambda and I get a natural measure s pi b. And just to get some practice, uh, so if lambda is supported only on the point zero, no matter what transformation I apply, I will still get the point zero. But for example, if lambda was supported only on the point all once, then if I apply the identity permutation, if I keep all k points and I apply as a multiply by this b, I will get this point, which is a completely different point. So it's a it's a measure which is supported on a completely disjoint support. Okay, these two. Okay, so just to make sure uh, that. Doing this transformation can completely shift lambda to a different support. Is the, is the definition of the measure and the transformation okay? All right. So once we have these uh, symmetries, it's uh, kind of easy to state our characterization. And okay. So recall, I mean, this is a workshop in Fourier analysis. So I guess uh, this is fairly easy. I can write f in its Fourier basis and. The characterization is that it's strongly approximation resistant if and only if there exists a measure lambda, uh, such that a condition holds for all t or all Fourier levels. And at each Fourier level, I want sort of some signed combination of, uh, of uh, these measure, of uh, these transformations of my original measure to vanish. And by vanish, I mean these are sort of identically zero functions. Okay. This, is, this is a function on uh, t plus t choose two coordinates and it's identically zero. Okay. So for example, if uh, lambda was supported on some point and this transformation was supported on some completely different points, they will not cancel. So you have to be like, you have to say when it's a zero function. But okay, so it's some condition and we'll see a little bit more about that. But before that, let me give you some sort of idea of how this comes about or what the proof looks like. Okay. So we want to study these two cases. These are this sort of uh, obvious that either a lambda satisfying those conditions exists or it does not. When it exists, proving at least unique games hardness is, uh, uses relatively standard ideas, in particular uh, ideas like Prasad's reduction, which sort of comes, which basically samples some kind of uh, mu's from this lambda and then constructs a dictatorship test according to that mu in some sort of standard way. Yeah. And this is not, uh, I mean, pretty much all sufficient condition, like sufficient conditions for approximation resistant are proved this way, and there's not much new here. Uh, it's sort of the other thing, which is if no such lambda exists, then we want to show that it's not approximation resistant or it's not strongly approximation resistant. 
And to do this, we actually set up another dichotomy, which is between, which is kind of a zero-sum game between an algorithm and a hardness player. Okay. And somehow their value is supposed to capture how different from a random assignment you are. And I'll describe this game a little more in the next slide. But uh, if you have this zero-sum game and the value is defined appropriately, the other direction becomes easy, easier from this dichotomy. So sort of, uh, the value is defined precisely in a way that when value is greater than zero, you get an algorithm which shows that it's not strongly approximation resistant. Okay. And most of the work is actually relating these two dichotomies. Or uh, sort of showing that when uh, the value is equal to zero, a good lambda exists, or sort of, uh, uh, well, and it has the necessary symmetry properties and so on and so forth. Okay. And by contrapositive, it sort of also shows the other. So, uh, so, yeah, the bulk of the paper is just relating these two notions. Okay, so let me say something more about this uh, zero-sum game and at least tell you how to define the value. Okay. And let me say this uh, it's a, a game which between two al like players, algorithm and hardness, was also used by O'Donnell and Wu for max cut, and then they wanted to characterize what's the right hardness threshold at certain points and so on. Okay. So we have two players, the algorithm and hardness. The hardness player tries to design an integrality gap instance. Integrality gap instance corresponds to a bunch of constraints, and in these SDPs, each constraint has uh, has k variables, and there are vectors corresponding to each of the variables, which have pairwise inner products, which gives you pairwise correlations, uh, and so on. So if you look at a particular constraint, it gives you some zeta, and if you look at the distribution over all constraints, it gives you a lambda, right? so if, uh, over all constraints in a single instance. So intuitively, a hardness player tries to design a hard instance, and his strategies are just uh, lambdas. And I'm saying, sort of the way that I'm defining the game, it's infinite. In fact, the set of strategies is uncountably infinite, but there are ways to handle that. The algorithm player tries to come up with a rounding strategy. So given an instance, he, the rounding strategy is sort of the most natural thing to do. You project uh, some vectors that you are given to some d-dimensional Gaussian space, and then for each point in that space, you decide whether uh, when the projection lands there, you'll label it plus or minus one, the variable. Okay. So a strategy for the algorithm player is this one. And I'll sort of show how the value of the game is decided by this. Okay. But these are the two set of strategies. And the value is supposed to be uh, the absolute, like, uh, the deviation from random. The expected fraction of satisf constraints satisfied by this uh, uh, rounding strategy psi when, uh, when the instance is captured by lambda. And obviously, when the value is greater than zero, it means that there exists a, a rounding strategy or maybe a distribution over rounding strategies which, uh, which witnesses the fact that for every lambda, you can have a positive deviation uh, from zero. Right? And uh, for every lambda, because of this correspondence, sort of in corresponds in a natural way to for every given instance. So uh, the way the value is defined, this part fairly easily gives an algorithm in terms of rounding, or once you have uh, the value greater than zero. And so let me just define the value of the game and, uh, well, say two words about it. So, so as I said, um, you can think of a hard instance as being captured by this lambda. So each uh, constraint is given by some zeta, where uh, you think of k variables in that constraint, and all pairwise correlations are given by the vectors corresponding to uh, those k variables. And usually there are local distributions over every k-tuple in all these SDPs. So these are all valid points in the polytope. And so the algorithm player is given these vectors whose inner products correspond to these entries of zeta. And it tries to round it. Uh, and by rounding, I mean, so it projects them to some sort of Gaussian space, uh, to Gaussians y1 to yk. And these will just have a correlation matrix which corresponds to zeta, where pairwise correlations will be according to the entries of zeta. Okay. So you'll just get k Gaussians with this distribution. And so the expected fraction of constraints satisfied is uh, on the probability of picking a random constraint uh, with a random projection to the Gaussians of the corresponding variables, when you apply the rounding strategy, is f satisfied or not? Right? And you can expand it in the Fourier basis and so on and so forth. So this term comes out, and what remains is uh, what is defined as the value of the game, yeah, pretty much. And, and then the rest of the uh, whole deal is to analyze this expression and understand it a little better. And this is my last slide on talk. Uh, so this is the value. And the value being 0 means that there exists a lambda, or actually a distribution over lambdas, which gives a value 0 for all psi. Right? That's uh, what the value being zero in a min-max game means, or zero-sum game means. 
And if you think of this value, you can view it as a polynomial in, again, the infinitely many variables uh, uh, corresponding to values of this function psi at all points in R to the D. Okay. And what I'm saying is this polynomial is zero for all assignments to this uh, variable C of y for every y. And this you can use to conclude that all coefficients are zero, and if you think of the coefficients, they come out to be some kind of linear combinations of integrals of these measures and so on. And with some analysis, you can conclude that uh, uh, if the integrals are zero with sort of all the rest right densities, then the measure linear combinations of measures themselves are zero and so on. And this last line takes about 30 pages to write down, but beyond that, sort of, that's the bulk of the work. Okay. So that's sort of the idea in, in a sort of cartoon way. And you say that uh, we also characterize approximation resistance because the notion is equivalent to approximation resistance for odd, odd predicates. We characterize approximation resistance, including threshold predicates which pass through the orig origin because they're odd. Also, we get a characterization of for k part right instances uh, for odd or even predicates. And we get characterizations of Shirali Adams LP gaps uh, or sort of when do gaps exist uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, the open problems are. Uh, First is the, the condition, this one is also recursively enumerable like Prasad and David's condition, but is it decidable and we don't know. And can you say that this lambda is always finitely supported? So far the results have one point, but we need a measure and we don't know a bound on the support size. Okay. And of course, sort of strong approximation resistance versus approximation resistance, can you find predicates which are one but not the other so, and so on. And yeah, I'll stop here. Yes. Yeah. So, are you able to use the characterization to classify new predicates? Or uh, well, anything? so far we haven't. In principle, we can run a computer search, and in particular on threshold predicates and so on, where the question is interesting. But uh, so far, we haven't done it. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, is there anything surprising that comes out? Of Sorry. This well. As a result, in terms of what can we characterize? Well, as I said, we haven't run a search on it. It was well. At least slightly surprising to me that there was a characterization, but uh, uh, in terms of particular predicate, we don't know yet. Yeah. Do you have any, a, a nice example of a case where the measure is not just an atom at zero, or, or it's a proximal? No, all results I just have an atom. Well, not zero, but some non-zero point, but they are all an atom. Yeah. So I think uh, if one is brave enough to actually uh, write programs and do computer searches, <laughs> Well, I guess sort of there is sort of a trivial example where it's not an atom in some sense, in, in the sense that, uh, in so if, uh, if I understand correctly, in papers of Johan and uh, Per, you need some certain coordinates to be zero, and the others uh, are just required to be either positive or negative in some sort of specific condition. Some moments are only just positive or just negative. Yeah, but you just need one measure. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, so if you exhibit a point, it is true, but you can take a collection of points with those properties and it will still be true. So in, that's just in a trivial sense that it's a non-concentrated measure. But it's still not true if you need them. I mean, if you don't need it. Yeah, yeah, you don't need it. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So it, it's a very trivial example. That's, yeah. So, I mean, is the Austrian muscle known to be tight? I mean, is it possible it's also necessary? No. So, in particular, the example of in paper of Per and um, uh, Johan that I was mentioning, it uh, is a predicate which uh, does not satisfy, uh, like, the, the, does not exist any pairwise independent distribution on its support, but it's still approximation resistant. Okay. So, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it shows that it's not tight. Any other questions? So, you don't have a suggestion for what is a real, uh, no, for what uh, character, characterization for approximating? For approximation resistant. Uh, um, no. No. So the example in, in the paper of Johan is, is that also strong approximation resistance, or is it just? It's not known. Well, um, I think it's not known to be strongly approximation resistant. Um, actually, there are a bunch of examples, but at least the one that is a modification of half's example. Is yeah, the, the JJST predicate. Uh, no. 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 Because there, because of the positivity yeah. conditions, yeah. you don't analyze the absolute value. So, 
So do you know a difference between strong approximation and this uh, like a concrete? No, so that was one of my problems. We don't know of an exact, uh, I mean, that example might actually be one which is approximation resistant, but not strongly approximation resistant, but I don't know of an explicit example. I'm kind of familiar with both results, so I'm sort of a bad judge. But, uh. So my favorite notion that you didn't notice, mention because I introduced it myself, is uselessness. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right? It's a different notion, but we're... Uh, Which is an even stronger notion, I guess, from so strong. I think, uh, but there, it should really be called super strong resistance, but you have a different perspective and you call it useless. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's stronger than strong resistance, I guess. So. <laughs> Because strong resistance just corresponds to a uselessness with k equals p and one minus p. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah. And then you have an oh, q equals, and you have an arbitrary q in your notion. Yeah, right? yeah. So. Oh. So, uh, for q, yeah, I think the whole thing also works for query, but uh, I don't think we wrote it down. But, uh, I mean. I mean, I don't think there is a problem with QRE as far as I know. But could it be that this characterizes approximate measure resistance? Uh, it could be. I mean, uh, because again, there is no counter example to this in terms of strong, uh, sort of, uh, for approximation resistance either. It, we don't know that the predicate in your paper is, sort of does not satisfy this characterization. Mm -hmm. And again, as Subhash said, we've been a bit cowardly in computer searches. That's sort of the reason. Okay, other comments or questions? Okay, thanks. <laughs> now we will have a short break of seven minutes until two, uh, 4 20.